Honey, what is this? What day is this? It's Tuesday, right? Is it Tuesday? Yeah, it's not Wednesday. <laughs> every day is the same for me, everybody. So, um, so that's why I never know the, the, the day of the week. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We'll give a couple people a couple of minutes. We were a little late coming in. So thank you for your patience. We really appreciate that. And, um, and you know what, I didn't do any bad jokes last time. And I got complaints that I didn't do a bad joke. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to share a bad joke. And I apologize to those of you who don't like bad jokes, but uh, we'll, we'll give another minute or two. And then I've got a, a picture I'd like to share. Um, Shane hasn't even seen it. So I, I'm hoping it'll, he'll like that picture. And then we'll get uh, right down to business and start talking about the wines. Yes, Carl. Yes, there will be a bad joke. So, and, and uh, yeah, the housekeeping, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. If you type them in there, I'll be moder moderating that and, um, and asking Shane at a, an appropriate time. He may be talking about something else when you do, if, if it's like any other time that people don't ask at appropriate times. And no, we, we don't mind that at all. We certainly appreciate the, the questions and the, and the engagement. Um, and thank you, Deb Russo. She's out in Vancouver and running the board for us tonight. First time ever. So, so take it easy on her. You know, no, no, don't unmute yourself and, and uh, cause trouble because Deb will be after you. I can tell you that for sure. So, so let, let's do the uh, bad joke first. And boy, I tell you, looking for this joke, there were so many jokes that I couldn't tell you that were so off color. It was dreadful. Just, um, so, and I thought this was really, um, really appropriate for these last three years of COVID where we've been all virtual, is that uh, I'm looking for a wine that pairs with my kids being home all day. <laughs> and I, I thought that was really good. Don't you, Carl? You thought that was a great joke, didn't you? <laughs> so, so, one more thing, uh, Shane, and then I'll introduce you, is I wanted to share my screen because I did this on the weekend. and. I made this particular um, dish and I've served it with the Pinot Grigio handmade from uh, this particular gentleman we're talking to tonight. And so this was a, a, it's called tuna cups. And then I did, that's not spaghetti, that's actually zucchini with basil and Parmesan. And uh, boy, did that ever pair well with this wine. It was just, just a remarkable thing. So thank you, Shane, for making the wine that made my dinner so special. I really appreciate it. So now we will uh, introduce the gentleman who makes these incredible wines. Um, I, I can tell you that the, the hearty wines are, are my favorites. I don't even have any K1 in the house today because I've drunk it all. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to it being in the, the cellar again, and I'll be placing the order. Shane Harris is the winemaker. Um, they have just gone through a weekend of uh, difficulty with some really bad weather. So I'm not sure we're going to be able to see Jeff Hardy tonight, but uh, Shane is ably able to talk about all of the wines that they make tonight. So over to you, sir, Mr. Harris. Oh, good morning, good evening. It is already Wednesday over here, which might be why you're confused. So uh, I can tell you tomorrow looks brighter than today. So not buckle in and we'll be all right. But yeah, we had some pretty crazy weather uh, here over the weekend. Some like 428,000 lightning strikes in 12 hours uh, with about 75 mil of rain in under two hours. Uh, uh, nearly 200,000 houses without power for four or five days. We've had a hell of a lot of uh, gum trees that haven't been tested for a while and lots of them decided to fall over. So uh it's pretty interesting. We've got a generator running here today, so hopefully that holds stable for the length of this tasting, which it should do. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely uh, a bit of excitement on the weekend. I, I missed it all because I took the kids down to the movie cinema and didn't know any of it was happening till the power went out because uh, we only really got about an hour, hour and a half's notice of the storm even coming. It hit the next uh, peninsula over from where we are and then they all of a sudden decided to put a uh, bad weather report out and it hit us about an hour, hour and a half later. So pretty interesting times, not too bad for where we are in the growing season. We haven't flowered yet. So other than a few broken canes because of the winds were up to about a hundred kilometers an hour in some areas as well. 
um, but we're sort of in a little cradle up in the hills, so we fared okay. Um, but yeah, that's where we're starting today, and it's a uh, yeah, pretty exciting year for Opimian being a 50-year anniversary this year. Uh, I was sort of talking to Jeff about it a while ago. Yeah, we've been uh, working with Opimian for over 20 years. We think it's 21 or 22, but there's no uh, firm records on exactly <laughs> when it started. But and uh, don't anyway, look to me, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's around that. And I think uh, I've been making the wines for uh, the offers with Jeff uh, since the 04, I reckon the 04 GMH Meritage was probably the first wine I put together for Opimian and still remains uh, one of the stronger uh, wines that keep coming in. And it's it's sort of a, a pretty interesting wine to put together each year. I think it's one of our strongest suits uh, in South Australia is that the quality of our Cabernets. But uh, I don't know where you want to go from there, Michael. Do you want to? Yeah, I, I think we. I always like to start with with some wine in our glass, and I don't think that that's just me. I mean, I can see Carl Bird's already drinking, and um, and so please feel free to. Uh, why don't we start with the feature wine? I think that that's that's the place to start. And for everybody, that's on on page two and three of your C three hundred, um, and the Shane's been. Uh, good enough to make this particular wine for us, the K1 special release, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot. Uh, so why don't we talk about it a bit and drink a bit of it as well? I don't have any of it, of course, because <laughs> uh, it's only been tasted by the MWs at this point. Yeah, so this is a really exciting wine. Uh, as I said, Cabernet, I think, is one of our strongest suits here in South Australia, particularly where we are in the southern Adelaide Hills. Um, but off this vineyard particularly, I think it's an absolutely shining example uh, and our lead variety. Now, funny enough, these, these vineyards were planted in 1986. We've never released a straight Cab Merlot. Uh, we've either been straight Cabernets or Petit Verdot and other things are getting involved. So it was a good opportunity to look for uh, a new blend. Obviously, the vintage is playing quite nicely as well. Um, but I'm happy enough with this blend. Uh, it started off as a, a sample over to the NWs and they loved it. And then I showed Jeff a couple of weeks later. And last week we've actually decided that we're gonna bottle some of the exact same blend and actually introduce a new wine into the K1 lineup. Oh, wow, wow. So that, you know, that is uh, pretty exciting for us. It's not every year that uh, a wine that we specifically put together for someone makes a new kid on the block. But this mm -hmm. one, particularly, I think, is is really special. <coughs> oh, that that's brilliant! And and so it's cab forward, cab forward. And I think yeah, it's it's really here. Our cabernet, we've had the K one cabernet before. It's quite structural. It is um, savoury, tan and dry. And I think the merlot just tempers that a little bit. It's going to make it a little bit more approachable early, um, but also it we get a lot of the red fruit in our cabernet, blue fruits, and our merlot tends to be. Uh, a little bit of sort of black olive, dark plums, hints of licorice. So I think it's adding complexity. It's not just adding softness to the Cabernet in this instance, it's adding complexity. We are about 300 metres above sea level on quite rocky soils up here. So our Merlot does tend to be quite structural as well. It's not just a, a ball of fruit in the mid palate. <laughs> um, so it's, I like to describe palates more in shapes. And I think it's more of a teardrop sort of shape, which adds the volume to the middle of the Cabernet, which is what we're always Cabernet is known to be an hourglass or a slightly thin in the mid palate. Um, Merlot mm. is the opposite. So it is quite round in the mid palate, but it, this does have quite a comet's tail at the back, which does lead back into the Cabernet. And I think it just stitches the two varieties together really well. Uh, of course, with nice lack of probably 25% new French oak. I haven't actually done the maths on it other than selecting <laughs> barrels right now. Yeah. But I just go through the barrel groups and go, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in. Um, so I'll work the maths out at some point, but it's about that. It's all open fermented in small batches, which is what we do with all of our premium fruit. I think it's just easier to handle and visualize and throw your arm in amongst the fruit every day and pull some fruit up from the cap and really get into it and smell it. You don't get that same ability to do that in, in larger closed vessels uh, with fermentation because if you stick your head in the top of that tank you just get a nostril full of uh, ferment gases rather than the fruit. Um, so that's how we normally handle it. 
it's been in Oak for 18 months now. So it's, as, as I said, and I noted uh, to Kim the other day, I think it's a good one to put away for the 60th anniversary. No, that, that, that's an interesting point because um, I, I did want Shane to talk to the membership a little bit about the changes that they'll see in the catalogue. And that is that uh, we've, we've, uh, we're not doing the M&Ds anymore. It was maturity and drinkability. It was a number out of 10. And we've now taken that to the, the drinking window. Uh, and the drinking window that uh, Louise has put on this, Louise Wilson, Master Wine, is 22 to 32. So she's saying yep. that essentially it peaks 10 years from now, but certainly drinkable when, when it arrives, which will be next year, it'll be 23 when it arrives, right? Absolutely. So a, a six pack to get you through the next 10 years and then a ten, yeah. another six pack to uh, drink in its peak. And yeah. always remembering that you know, the wines tend to build up to 10 years, but there's also quite a few years of a plateau or even getting slightly better. I think a good gauge on this one would be 10 to 15 years. So nice. it does to have another a six pack in your cellar for that peak drinking window it sort of means you can see it once or twice a year in its absolute peak. Uh, when someone worthy comes around to visit. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I, love, um, I, I love the fact that we get these cases of six so I can try them. I, I typically do one a year, but you're yeah. right. I'm going to need two of this so that I can do it's, one it's a year good. until yeah. it peaks, right? The, so the, the, that, the, work. My train of thought is if you buy a six pack, you've got three shots at getting the guessing the peak right and then you've got three yeah. bottles to win. That's you've right got, to drink at it. Dozen. So really your aim the best aim is to have three to four bottles to drink in its absolute full expression of what the wine was intended to be. Right. If you've got right. more wines in the gap in between, I mean it's gonna be a fairly <clears throat> interesting wine throughout its life anyway. We do have the plushness of obviously the Australian fruit, but our elevation and rocky soils do give us uh, a lot of opportunity for cellaring here. During COVID, we uh, obviously couldn't have the cellar door open. So we took a chance of been working with Jeff since 2006. And we'd never done verticals of some of the varieties that we produce here. We just don't have time or we'll pull out a selection of five or six vintages. Uh, but during COVID, we pulled out uh, K1 Cabernets back to 2099. Oh, wow. Uh, Duraz back to the same vintage, uh, Chardonnay's back to 2002, Grunewald Lena back to its inception in 2011. Um, so it was really interesting to go through the wines. And I'd, I'd say any of the wines back to 99 with the Cabernet and Shiraz, none of them would be considered uh, to be over the hill. Isn't that just wild? Yet. Yeah, very, very and good. Considering they were quite you know, young vines when those so planted in 86, um, mm -hmm. and we're talking about mid to late 90s uh, wines it's pretty impressive record that's marvelous and and carl finally gave up with his hand up thanks carl for your patience and he's written his his questionnaire so is this exclusively for opinion or will it be available in australia and i i think you answered that question that uh, we're the first we get the first crack at it but you decided to it. add it to your line right that, absolutely uh, and yeah. uh, a new look k1 label under as well so that label will only be uh, in Canada, the blue looking label. So you're the first people to see that. And we'd really like for premium members when they do get it in their hands and feel and look at the label. Um, if anyone's got any feedback on that as well, because it's sort of something that we're looking at uh, mm -hmm. label design and things at the moment. And we just thought that great opportunity to have a go and trial one in the flesh and have it sit on a bottle. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the way it's scrubbed up. Things look pretty good. Yeah, I think it looks great. Okay. And and even when Kim Chen's not here, she puts her stamp on this. She's suggesting that we would do the Verdejo next. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And you've got that handy as well. Ready, pulled, ready to go. Wonderful. But uh, yeah, Verdejo is an interesting one for us. Um, and this is appearing both in the mixed pack of wines from us, but then also the new white wine program. It's one of the wines. So it appears twice in this offer depending on where you'd like to see it. But Vidello isn't a stranger to Australia. So our handcrafted range tends to be alternate varieties uh, and or alternate styles of certain wines as well. Vidello has been in Australia since the 1840s, I want to say, but 
the 1840s to 1860s it was planted as a fortified variety to make white port and tawny port out of. Since then, it's sort of been a fringe variety and always sits around the edges, but hasn't really had its day in the sun. Came into a bit of popularity in Australia, late 80s through to mid 90s, where people were really pushing an alternative to Sauvignon Blanc, particularly in warmer areas. It does perform quite well and hold its acidity. That led to people then introducing malolactic fermentation, barrel fermentation, and going the Australian line of more is more and making them big and malo-y characters. And then again, it peered away to the fringes a little bit. This is sort of a re-look. We used to make Vidello sort of late 2000s. We used to sell quite a bit of it domestically here in Australia. Um, and just Peter, everyone got excited about Fiano coming on board, Arnais, Grunewald Lino. There's a myriad of other whites out and about. This vineyard planted here is the same vineyard that we sourced the Petit Vidot from uh, for the Meritage. Um, so it's limestone coast fruit. The vineyard's over 30 years old now. So we've got maturity of vine, mature fruit planted. And after working with some of these Italian varieties, I've said to Jeff, I'd like, because we note all the time, the growth habits, the bunch structure, the phenology of the grape in the vineyard looks very similar to Fiano. And if you didn't know a planting was Fiano or Vidello, I, I think a lot of people would actually get confused between the two. So we've actually brought in Vidello and done more Italian white um, varietal handmaking techniques, a little bit of skin contact. I'm not one to get crazy on making orange fully skin contact <laughs> and fermented on skins white. You but, anticipated that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not in my uh, current playbook, but there is a lot of, in the same way as when we're making white whites, lots of the finer nuances and flavor are very close to the skin. With a thick skinned variety, so remembering Fiano is quite thick skinned, Vidello being similar, if you put the fruit straight into a press and start squeezing it, you don't really get really good access to those flavors close to the skins. So I add enzyme early and give it a six to eight hours uh, of skin contact and then press it off. Uh, so it's not fermented on skins, but what it has done is brought an absolutely lovely spiciness to the wine. So Normally you get a hint of lemongrass with Vidello uh, from cooler climates. This is big, big lemongrass, pickled ginger, along with those apple, apple blossom characters uh, that it's renowned for. And that spiciness is what I think this wine is. I've taken this wine to more winemakers get togethers with a plastic bag over it or paper bag in the last two years than any other wine. It has just done really well in a wine tasting last week that I was part of, but I can't uh, release what that is or what it did, but <laughs> it uh, performed really well uh, in a judging panel of three winemakers for a substantial uh, magazine over here. Uh, the other two judges were all on it for, um, you know, five stars or gold medal. Um, and the two other judges proclaimed they think it's the best Vidello uh, that they've ever tasted. Um, and five minutes earlier, they were bagging Vidello as part of the best and no one wants to talk about it. Um, and I knew this wine was going to come up in the next class because I knew I'd sent wines in for the tasting. Um, and there was three Videllos of, in that class. And this one's really, really stuck its neck out and said, pick me, pick me. And from a class of three judges and two poo-pooing that they'll never taste another Vidello or buy a bottle themselves uh, to coming out of that tasting and both of them on five stars. Um, both of them saying it's the best Vidello they've ever tasted, I think is a good uh, affirmation of good. that stylistic change is, was uh, a good way to go. I think it, it works with the variety. I've pushed it further with another brand this year with Vidello off this same vineyard and actually fermented some of it on skins uh, for a couple of weeks as well, just to push the envelope and see how far we can push with it. But I'm really excited about this wine. It's so food friendly because it's not... Yeah, the, the 90s Vidillos were so fruit forward and pulpy, pineapple, passion fruit. And they, they get a, like a varnish over the top of them when they're that loud and over the top. Uh, this is pulled back and restrained. It has a savory note in amongst that lemongrass pickled ginger character. And you know, this would go really well with that zucchini and basil. Uh, they pulled uh, up for uh. anything, Thai, anything. Yeah, green chicken curries and things like that. This would absolutely be a Monty for. I'm definitely in. 
Absolutely, thanks. And and Carl, do you want to ask your question? You can unmute yourself and ask. Sure, it was just a clarification. So this Verejo, is it is it the same wine that's in both the um, the bottle shop web web, web exclusive uh, mix case and the um, white select? Yes, yeah, it's the same one. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So there's um Vidello as so, well. So, so it looks is... like I'm going to have five bottles of it then. <laughs> and do get back to me and, and let you know what you think of it. Uh, all of these wines, we're always up for you know feedback on them. Um, we're, we're not an island in the stream. We we are very open and, and keen to hear what people think when they land in the bottle. But I, I, for me, I think that's oh, again. Um, it's about two dozen of that goes through my house a year. Wow. So so let's go to the founder's choice and don't tell everybody who it is or we'll have to kill them. So um, <laughs> so just if uh, if you've got that in front of you, it's, it's obviously a red. Yeah, um, absolutely. Let, let's just talk about it, some tasting notes there. What I've always told members is that, that this founder's choice program is such that uh, you, you get a guaranteed number of, of uh, bottles. And so you're able to give us uh, a value that's that's just overwhelming. Like it punches way above its weight for what you pay for the founders program. So if you can talk a little bit about the the tasting notes on this, that'd be brilliant. Absolutely, and I think you know for us again because we're submitting uh, blended samples to the MWs, it's a chance where, and particularly in Australia, we don't have rules on what we can and can't do. No one tells us what we can grow or picking times or anything like this. So this is really unleashed winemaking and it gives us, us a chance to really push the envelope uh, a couple of years ago which i can't remember the exact year michael but we did uh, a cabernet uh, lagrange toroldigo blend yeah i had a bottle of that last week and my gosh is it looking good and it's a variety those varieties may have some chance of meeting each other in the wild or in the old world uh, cabernet may struggle to get ripe up in the north of italy but there's at least a chance that those varieties would meet. This year's selection is a blend that I've been looking to do for a little while or had thoughts about it, how it would work. But when we're producing over 100 different wines a year for different customers, uh, you don't always get time to experiment the way we would. So it's one of those things I've had, if an opportunity comes up, I want to try this. Um, and this wine's come through. I think it's really interesting. There is no chance in hell that in the old world that these parties would meet each other. It's <laughs> right. quite interesting. Um, well, so there's never going to be a super Adelaide like there is a super Tuscan. You don't need to. Well, we, we, <laughs> yeah, super Kuiper. We have talked about something in that vein several times. Yeah. Um, I think you, if you've seen our Zemican uh, wine before was Amarone style, I think that with uh, sort of Italian varieties is another thing that's on the list of things I'd like to try <laughs> if we get time to play with that sort of level. But these two, you know, I was talking to three weeks ago, I was talking to a Bordeaux producer uh, and they're saying they planted some Shiraz in Bordeaux and how interesting it is and how well it is growing and how the reaction to customers and all this sort of thing. And I said, well, you know, you used to hang a lot of on us because traditionally in Australia we blend Shiraz and Cabernet together and there's multiple articles if you go looking at it, the French absolutely calling us all sorts of names under the sun saying those two varieties would never be planted in the same place why would you do that they're not friends they're not and I just said so have you blended Shiraz and Cabernet together yet to see what we're on about and he said off the record it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> so you know the, the, the context is now both grapes grow and in the same area, it, grabbing Shiraz and Cabernet from opposing regions, they may not talk together, they may not work, but if you add the commonality of growing it in a, in a similar environment, uh, then you've got region and terroir coming into it and that does help stitch varieties together. So it's really interesting where Bordeaux, now they've had another five varieties added to what they're allowed to plant. Shiraz wasn't on that list, so they've done it off their own backs to have a look at the variety. They can't use any Appalachian claims on it, but they said, as soon as we have a mailing list or let our customers know that the Shiraz is back, it's selling out really quickly and having really wow. good results. So it's interesting. Uh, the old world won't admit to learning something oh, from the new world, but, uh, yeah. you know, 
it will never be classified, but I think in new yeah. world order, and particularly in Bordeaux, uh, to rock against the rules is probably seen to be a rock star move at the moment. Yeah, and that, that's what I mean is that that it is an old style appellation program, right? And and I think I think guys like you are proving that that it's not necessary. It doesn't always have to be that way. Right? No, exactly. Yeah. And just because it was a rule a hundred years ago, I mean, we keep looking at yeah. lack of global warming or the effects of change in weather patterns, which we uh, you know, saw with storms on the weekends. Uh, it's an evolving wheel. And it's not just the old guard thinking there's rule, you know, there's rules that my great 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 granddad wrote, wrote down, and I'm going to stick to them. Um, things change, and yeah. Yeah, we are linked to the fashion industry. Things go in and out of fashion. We're not immune to things being popular and unpopular. I mean, you look at some of the the wild uh, natural wines and orange wines out now. Thirty years ago, they wouldn't have even got a look in. Um, right. But now there's just a, a wider acceptance of what it means to be a wine that's approachable and what's appropriate. Um, but this, uh, it's it's three varieties. Can I say it's three? Well, I've said yes, three you varieties, can. so it's too late. I've it's, said it. No, no, it, no, you can't say that. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no that's three great. Three varieties that would never have met in, in the old world. That's quite an interesting wine. Again, we're talking about those palette shapes and how things move across the palette. I think these varieties do melt together really well. Um, texturally, I think you know, lots of red wine, particularly from the new world, misses texture. Um, and that's a big part of what I think you'll, hopefully you'll see in our wines that they do have good texture and, and tannin profiles that are real ripe fruit tannins rather than propped up with uh, artificial tannins or anything like that. So we're looking forward to that wine of giving structure. And this one is more, it's not about oak. It's, it's been in old oak, but it hasn't had any new oak. And it's more about stitching those fruit tannins together to give a similar profile to what you would expect a 15% new oak edition may do. Um, so we've just changed some handling techniques in the winery to give us a framework of tannin. Um, and I think it's really interesting. And hopefully it ages exactly the same as the, the Cabernet that, that was uh, going to be my well, question. Yeah. So, so it'll arrive drinkable for sure. With the the, the right. tannins will be integrated enough, but the, they'll Absolutely. continue to evolve, right? Yep, it's it's a textural component, so they're not yeah. sitting above the fruit. It's nicely integrated uh, wine, so it's not it's it is stitched together. But in place of new oak, we've just gone up a little bit on fruit tannin, and that right. may give an indication to one of the varieties that might be there. Yeah, I, I've been a member of Founders Choice for so long, and I look forward to them every time they come. For those of you that uh, may not be in the program or know about it, it's six bottles. Uh, when you join the program, you get those six bottles automatically ordered for you every seller during the, the 10 seller season, and uh, they start arriving. And you can sign up for that on your dashboard. You just have to sign in, and you'll see that there's a place to, to add yourself to the Founders Program. And, uh, and there is a limited number of people allowed in the program. I think we're at about 1,100 people at the moment. Um, it's, uh, it's a very popular program. And, and again, it's always such great value. I, I know here in Ontario, um, I'm, I'm in the mid-30s, I think, a bottle. And, and this stuff always drinks so much better than that. It's, uh, it, it always blows me away. And then, I, and then we do that whole same the six, six bottle thing, Shane, is that I always drink one when it arrives and make notes. And then I, I wait. To, it'll depend on what I taste that first time, whether I wait one or two years for the next bottle to open. And exactly. then I always leave that last bottle until it's stupid old because I love <laughs> old wine and, and it's uh, it's just great. So Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what you judge off that, that your first guess off a base of six bottles, you want to go, you know, it's going to go at least two years. So that's where you really want to pin it out. Because again, if you only got a six pack, you really aim to get three bottles in its premium drinking window. Um, and that'll arrive just at the start of summer or summer-ish. So I think Korean barbecue pork or something like that would go really well with this wine. Mm. Um, but certainly get outdoors, cook over coals and invite a few mates. Or a couple of mates so you do get a second glass. That's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. And so let's go to your single vineyard, uh, <coughs> K K1 Middle Hill. Middle Hill, now I'm mm -hmm. 
I didn't pre-pour this one, but Middle Hill is quite an interesting wine for us. I think it's one of our real signature wines off the K1 vineyard here. Um, one, because again, we're talking about the elevation that we have. So we are 350 metres uh, above sea level here, but this is our very rockiest part of the vineyard. Most of that only has about two foot of topsoil over some fractured limestone. And by fractured limestone, I mean, Jeff may or may not have used dynamite to fracture it himself. <laughs> so there's a big shelf of limestone yeah. through that vineyard um, and the vines when you go out. And that is another point. We did actually have a Pimian members here at Celador last week. And wow. I, didn't get, I didn't get to see them. So they wanted a photo with Jeff. They've had the photo, but Jeff didn't get their names or a photo with them to actually share back with uh, you guys during the program. But uh, if anyone is coming this way, definitely yeah. don't not reach out and have a look. But when you make a vine work like that, it's incredible. The vines were planted exactly the same time as the vines around them, but the trunks would be twice as thick. The amount of wood they put on, because they know they have to work every moment, when the sun's shining, they put on carbohydrate, they put on weight um, to get them through the times they need to struggle. And it really is amazing. Uh, the exact same variety planted in two different parts of the vineyard. One has twice the amount of trunk size over the same period of time. It doesn't mean it gives it more body. And, and if anything, it's actually more towards a medium bodied uh, Shiraz than our other K1 Shiraz, the Middle Hill, but it brings in a beautiful spice character. Um, this is one of few wines of ours where you actually smell a little bit of eucalypt on it, but you've got the wild fennel, which only seems to be in that corner of the vineyard. Beautiful lavender, blue fruit, and just a hint of Viognier. So we actually co-ferment this with a couple of percent of uh, Viognier. Hmm. And that's the, the other part of this, this vineyard being rockier, uh, and the vines working a little bit harder means the crop is a little bit lower, but also means it ripens probably a week earlier than the other block of Shiraz, which is handy because by that stage, the Viognier is ready and waiting for Shiraz to be ripe, to be picked. Um, they're co-fermented together. And then anywhere between 10 and 15% whole clusters of Shiraz are also in that ferment. Open fermenters again, so we can really get in amongst the ferment and monitor it for tannin extraction, um, but uh, absolute beautiful framework. Uh, again, in a medium bodied sense, it's not that big bolstering Australian dark fruit. It's quite complex. Um, and again, the very good value for money. I think this is a very good introduction to the K1 vineyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and everybody on the call, if, if you haven't ordered a K1 in the past and haven't tried one, you just can't go wrong. It's, it's phenomenal. Anything in the line, I have to admit, but uh, but I'm really excited about the single vineyard Middle Hill. That uh, should be really something. So then uh, our direction. So funny uh, enough, Michael, that uh, we named that wine uh, particularly because it, it comes from a hill and that hill tends to be in the middle of the vineyard. Right. Uh, we got really creative with that one. Um, but it's I, I'm amazed at your place. creativity. It's, it's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> so if you, if you do see any uh, shot of the, the cellar door on a vineyard here, that block, so we've got the big lake, which is our thing when you turn up here, is one of very few cellar doors in Australia that's sitting on a lake, which is our natural catchment for uh, rainwater, obviously. But that mm -hmm. block is directly behind that building. So if you do see any aerial shots of the winery itself, it's the elevated block just behind the cellar door. Wonderful. I, I'll try and look for that so I can share it with the group uh, before we go. Um, and so then we we do have two that couldn't fit into the uh, into the um, catalog, so we've got them online only. Um, they're web exclusives. They're the the GMH Cab Sauv and uh, Meritage. No, we're not allowed to say Meritage, are we? We have to say Meritage because well, we're not that, French. This is, this is one I've never known. I, the only one I've had was sort of taken from heritage so yeah um you're probably yeah. right heritage, I, I, I I actually heritage think, but that's just i think the french have actually registered the pronunciation <laughs> so that you're not it's, not, it's not their word isn't it a californian <laughs> that's, word that's, well california would say it is but i think that uh, the french had it for them so i've got the 2019 that i haven't opened in a while so 
I'll be curious to see. And and what vintage are we are we offering this time? It's the twenty one. No, nope, that yeah. Uh, yeah, the twenty one. So. So in this one, I think the, even the GMH line uh, is it, it can sell her beautifully, can't it? It's uh, absolutely, and, but, yeah. and particularly this uh, Meritage is is the the one to go for in that lineup to put down for a little bit. I uh, opened a bottle of 2012, probably about six months ago, which would have been the start of our winter, uh, with a nice roast leg of lamb, and. I opened it while waiting for friends to turn up and there wasn't much left by the time the leg was ready <laughs> and it turned up. So I had to open another bottle of something else. Oh, uh, I don't have a, a lot of those older vintages, <laughs> but certainly 2012 is still looking quite vibrant. Um, it's always a blend of this of the, the Cabernet, Petit Vido, Merlot mix. Some years we do go Petit Vido predominant on this wine, which is a major feature of it. There wouldn't be any uh, Meritage wines or Meritage wines that are Petit Vido predominant. Here in Australia, we get right every so, year. Like what percentage when you say it's dominant? How What, what are you putting in there? Diva? From 55, I think it's been as high as 65. No kidding. Isn't yeah, yeah. that something? Wow. And that's yeah, why that's... I've got that dark, mulberry, dark, really Christmas cakey uh, aroma as well. And spice. Uh, Petit Vido gives good spice. Uh, that's from the same vineyard on the limestone coast that the Vidello comes from. Um, if you've seen our Montepulciano is down there. Um, some of the Lagrain that we take is down there. So it's a really interesting uh, winery or just the sunlight hours. So limestone coast, if you don't know, is further south than us. This vineyard mm -hmm. particularly is out near the Victorian border. So it's not particularly close to the coast, but it falls into a, a, a geographical area of limestone coast but it has masses of limestone in the soil down there. It's a dead sea, basically. It was a sea, however many millions of years ago, we find seashells in the vineyard with they're digging up posts and holes. It's quite interesting, but really cool nights. So being a little bit more continental in climate, it gets really diverse drops in temperature at night, but will warm up to sort of, do you, oh, I can't think of Fahrenheit, around 30, to 32 yeah. degrees Celsius during the day. Um, yeah, and then nice we're, we're, we're in Celsius time. here in Canada too, so we're good. That's, <laughs> uh, and and uh, you know what, I've been ignoring the, the chat, so I apologize. Ken Clark was saying it's excellent information for choosing the wine. It, it's our pleasure, Ken. I'm glad you could join us. And Paul Barnes is asking, what's a suggested food pairing with the Meritage or the Meritage? That roast leg of lamb, I, it, yeah. it goes so well. Um, Depending on time of year and how keen I am, I love cooking over coals myself. Um, I call myself a reformed chef rather than an ex-chef. So I sort of left that behind when I started chasing the wine industry. Um, but there's something very primal about cooking over coals. I think in that vein, I like to butterfly the lamb leg out and take remove the bone. Roasting in an oven, bone does help keep moisture in, but I love nothing more than those bits of... Uh, quite caramelized uh, meat on the edge of lamb, I think is absolutely delicious. So I like those little bit of crusty edges and then you cut through the meat and it's really lets the smoke permeate uh, through the leg as well. Um, and just, you know, rosemary and potatoes. Don't, get, don't make it complex uh, in the meal, just enjoy it basically. Yeah, and I agree with Paul. He's hungry now and my mouth's watering. So you described <laughs> that exceptionally well. And and I would even say that the, what I was hearing in that pairing is that that spiciness of, of the of the uh, Petit Verdot uh, in that Meritage would pair really nicely with something that, that strong a meat, yeah? Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, if you do go the cooler months, don't be afraid of anything that's sort of um, stewed or anything with it, uh, you know, um, Hungarian sort of goulash and stuff like that would go quite well. Um, but, you know, just friends, barbecue, outside, entertaining. Puts mm -hmm. a smile on your dial. And it, yeah. the Meritage, because you've got those blend of varieties as well, it's one of those wines that really opens up during a tasting. And it doesn't matter if it's six months old or 10 years old. It still has this chameleon-like ability to open up and open like a mm -hmm. flower during a tasting. So it's one of those wines that you can sort of put in the middle of the table, everyone's tasting it. And in between you get, every time you look at it, you see something slightly different. 
Very cool. So it's a good wine to sort of have around as a conversation piece, talk about it. I uh, bought this, where it comes from. It's a pretty interesting wine. Uh, the Merlot comes from the Adelaide Hills up here. The Cabernet tends to be Adelaide Hills, Limestone Coast. Um, and sometimes there's cheeky a little bit of Melbeck in there as well. So I think the 19 that you have there, Michael, might have a little bit of Melbeck mm. in it, mm. um, which just adds a pop of sort of blue fruit in the back and sort of lots of light gravelly note in the back as well. And and I, I wanted to say to, to the membership that in a in a year where everything is more expensive, like what bottles are up 50%, 60%, just the glass. And it just and shipping, yeah, shipping is insane at the moment. Yeah. Um, labels. And so um, just getting paper stock uh, during COVID was really difficult because it wasn't the printers that had a problem because they got massive uh, printing machines. They can stay away from each other. But mm -hmm. getting a warehouse to dispatch something was near impossible. Really hard. And transport and so companies. I don't know. It's the same with you guys, but just tra road always. transport is just crazy at the moment. Even yeah. domestic transport. You can't even find em empty uh, containers. Like it's nice. just they're they're all it, and so so this this 2021 that's in the current offering is actually a lower price than last year. Which I don't know how you did that, Shane. But thank you. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> we we certainly appreciate it. You so, asked very nicely. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's, and I can tell you the 19 is is tasting just gorgeous. I don't think I've got your palate that I can tell there's Merlot in it, but uh, hmm. I just uh, I can't get enough of it. Which is as I is guess, the 2018, which I'm drinking. Ah, good job. Yeah. See, we're doing a vertical right here, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, the 2018 wine is looking sensational. I really, really rate that one. As a, a, a 18 in Australia was an incredible Cabernet year across the board. Um, so a K1 18 Cabernet is one of, I think, the best wines we've ever made. Um, it's just sensational and, and continues to be sensational. But that Meritage 18 was pretty special looking wine, I think. Yeah, and and so yeah, the the Meritage I'm I'm going to be ordering for sure, and and I I did I I shouldn't do this, and uh, David don't look, but um, I want you all to be jealous that I've got this uh, K1 uh, Autumn Harvest. It they didn't, and we we talked about this, Shane. Um, you were you were saying you haven't been able to make it because let let's talk about that. Yeah, so that that one uh, does rely on botrytis, so it is a. Uh... An infection that takes over when the grapes are ripe. So we sort of need, we need enough sunshine that we get them ripe enough. Then we need the weather to shift. And we normally do get a little bit of winter. If we don't get rain, we get the dew starts getting heavier and heavier and have moisture around the vines. And we need that botrytis to take off to drive that style. Unfortunately, this year, the temperature was right. The grapes were ripe enough, but it just, the botrytis wouldn't take off. Uh, a little bit too dry so unfortunately we've got a little bit of a pause on that hopefully 2023 he, uh, can do it and if the rain we've had so far uh, this growing season is anything to gauge by it, it shouldn't be a problem but we uh, you're not the only people that are asking about it and for it so yeah. we're by our artists that's all we can do um, we are at, at the mercy of the weather gods, so all we can do is try, and uh, I'm sure we'll give it another crack. It's it's both the beauty and the horror of making wine, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And it's, yes, a, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you know, if, if it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was, uh, you know, I think that's what separates uh, different wine companies at times, is their ability to ebb and flow with the season that they're, they're handed and what... Uh, what it is, because you know, it's one of very few industries that do that. Um, and, you know, Wagyu beef tends to taste like Wagyu beef most of the time, um, regardless <laughs> of what season it's had. So um, grains can change a little bit with season to season, but we don't really get to see that expressed in, probably see it in beer more than whiskey and probably see it even more in pasta than beer. So we are an agricultural industry and we can only play the hand we're given and that's all we can do. But that, yeah, that that autumn harvest, I, th I think that would be closest to our, our most awarded wine. It just keeps picking up trophies whenever we can produce it. And that's the first time that we've ever missed 
not being able to make it because of weather conditions. So yeah. I'm sure it'll come back. Right. All right. Well, has anybody in, any other questions or we'll let uh, Shane go? It's as, as you say, it's Wednesday morning. It's and, Wednesday uh, morning, but De Jeff Hardy's just popped in. Oh, just like wonderful. Hi. 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 Hey. <laughs> Mr. Hardy, it's good to see you. I poured you a glass of uh, Meritage to taste. Oh, no, everyone good, very good. <laughs> cheers. Celebrating the 50th uh, year of Opinion. Cheers. Thanks so much for joining us. I know you're extremely busy with the damage that, that happened very recently. Oh, so. it's un unbelievable over here. I mean, it seems to be a worldwide problem, all of this, um, all these weather, uh, outrageous weather conditions. But um, we've been touring the vineyards of the district just just now and um, looking with my agronomist at, at the damage, it's not too severe and, and flowering still a few days away from the Chardonnay. So we, 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 we're hopeful that it won't affect us too much. Uh, good for you. That's good news. And so you've been uh, enjoying a chat with Shane? Very much so. He seems to know what he's doing. Do you agree, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely the master winemaker in this district, that's for sure. Yeah, and Mark's asking what's in your glass, and I think I heard Shane say that he's giving you some heritage there, yes? That's yes, right. That's, yeah. It's a really um, lovely blend in uh, year in, year out, isn't it? It's, uh, it's great to have such a uh, good marriage of uh, Cabernet S varieties. Yes, and... And I, I don't think I've shown it to everybody, but these were all of my my uh, Jeff Hardy wines. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't opened them all, I promise you, everybody. <laughs> and and, and I, I said, Jeff, that I'm out of the K1 because it's one of my favorite top 10 of, of all time. And and I've just drunk it all. I, I, I serve it all the time and um, I've, I've got to replenish my cellar. So uh, I'm glad it's in the current offering. Fantastic. Yeah, no. We look forward to getting it across to you. No, yeah. that's great. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about the trouble in that as well. Trying to get it across the water is is so difficult these oh, days. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just incredible the uh, the lack of containers and and ships and ships getting blocked by big ships and <laughs> all that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, we just have to get the members to order more so that we can buy our own containers and bring them over. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to buy a boat there for a second. Oh, yeah, well, well, we'll get there. We'll get there, Shane. Just give us time. <laughs> so we, we This is our 50th anniversary. Give us another 10 years. <laughs> well, we'll celebrate with the Cab Merlo at the end of all that because it'll yeah. still be there in 10 years' time. Absolutely. That's right. Yes, exactly. I'll have it in my cellar. I can promise you that. So. so yeah, yeah, that's because excellent. I think, uh, you know, the society should put a case away themselves to bring out uh, for that tasting, and we'll do the same at this end, and we'll. Uh, oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a great, great idea. Well, that's yeah. super. Well, thank that you, gentlemen, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Enjoy your morning. We were yeah. evening here, and yeah. uh, thank you, everybody, the opinion members, for joining us, and uh, and Deb for running the board for us. And, uh, and Carl for all your questions and David for joining us. Just thank you, everybody. Enjoy your evening and morning and uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Absolutely. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.